hold the interest. This will be most start. I just wanted, before we start, I just wanted to remind you, uh, if you have to leave before everything ends, please do so quietly, uh, because there has been some, I wouldn't say go so far as take complaints, but there were, you know, mentions. <laughs> so if you have to leave uh, while the Q&A is still going on, for example, just be sure to be as quiet as possible. I just wanted to say that before. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Aditi Majumdar. Uh, it is my pleasure today to introduce you to Dr. Suren Jaisuria. He comes from Arizona State University. He is a faculty there. And he has a very interesting background. He is a professor in arts, media, and education, engineering, engineering and the electrical uh, and computer engineering. And more importantly, he has this really exciting research, which kind of gels art with science and engineering, which I'm really looking forward to hearing about. He got his PhD from Cornell University, and after that, he was in CNU for his postdoctoral fellowship. So without much more ado, I give you Dr. Jaisuria. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aditi, for hosting me, and thank you for all listening. Uh, so today, I'm actually going to do a topic that not many of you are familiar, acoustic cameras, and I'll kind of talk about that. Um, but really, the, it really stems from the success of what I would call visual computing, computer graphics, computer vision, data science methods applied to visual data. They've been working very well. Um, you know, I'll focus on self-driving cars. I don't know if UC Irvine, if you guys have self-driving cars around by Phoenix, you can actually pull up a Waymo app and take a ride to anywhere except the airport. <laughs> they still haven't figured out how to drop self-driving cars in the airport, uh, <laughs> drop off lane would be very dangerous. So clearly like vision is working in a lot of different contexts. So what's left for researchers to do um, and for students who want to go out into imaging? Well, there are a lot of environments that are still difficult for conventional imaging because of the environment. Things like long range environmental sensing, medical applications, classic problems like seeing through fog and smoke, seeing underwater or low light. Now, this is not new. These problems have been tackled with a class of techniques called tomographic or synthetic aperture. So if you take CT, that stands for computer tomography, that's a way to measure your body using multiple observations. Um, or things like synthetic aperture radar for remote sensing and synthetic aperture sonar using sound, which I'll talk about today. Um, so I'm going to focus on acoustic imaging. And uh, acoustic imaging is the use of reflected sound waves to form visual products in 2D or 3D. Now, why do we think this is possible? So all of you are probably familiar with the camera and capturing uh, using light to capture images, but it can be done with sound. And in fact, dolphins and bats both use sound or echolocation to navigate the environments. Uh, dolphins have this fatty tissue called the melon in the front of their snout that actually acts like a resonator. Um, and bats use a principle called time of flight. They basically listen to the sound as it comes back and that delay tells them how far away. One thing I didn't know until I started doing this research, humans can actually echolocate. So there are actually <clears throat> visually impaired uh, individuals can actually be trained to echolocate. So they kind of click in the back of their throat and they use that information to help them with uh, um, mobility and navigation. So it's not like not everyone can do this to varying degrees of ability, but you can actually be trained. And there's been some NIH studies that have shown the training of echolocation. So modern technologies that utilize acoustic uh, data is like biomedical ultrasound and sonar imaging. So let me introduce this idea of the acoustic camera. It's actually a term not created by myself, but by a physiologist in the late 1800s when they were imaging, they were trying to figure out how sound vibrations affected the inner ear. Um, and we can think of it as an imaging device used to localize sound sources in an environment. So here you see a visual image and you can see there's this heat map that's kind of telling you that there's acoustic energy coming from that location. Um, it could be passive, you could just listen using a set of microphones, or it could be active where you send something into the scene like sonar, and then you listen to the reflection back. If you go on Amazon or uh, to go buy an acoustic camera today, these are the kind of products you would see. 
this primarily from manufacturing. So let's say there's some problem with your manufacturing plant. They actually want to use an acoustic camera to figure out if there's a leak. Because that leak in a pipe will emit ultrasonic frequency. And you'll be able to hear it. Or they actually map like car engines to tell like how well they're working by looking at the acoustic. Because then maybe visually the, the engine or the mechanical part looks fine, but the acoustic signal gives you some like, information. But I was really interested in, okay, we've had a lot of success with visual computing, uh, computer graphics and vision. How do we use these techniques to improve acoustic vision? And I'm gonna talk about new advances in what's called self-supervised machine learning, neural fields and rendering. And I'll, I'll kind of tease at the end of this talk, I'll show you a couple slides about the future that I'm envisioning where we use multimodal imaging systems. You know, dolphins and bats still have visual systems. How could we combine visual and acoustic systems together for new applications? So in this talk, I'm gonna focus on a technology called synthetic aperture sonar. And probably most people are not as familiar with this. So SAS is a highly advanced imaging technology. Usually you have a sonar array either being dragged along a boat, like towed along a boat, or actually in an autonomous underwater vehicle. It measures uh, acoustic signals underwater primarily, and it can form data products such as this is like a German U-boat at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so you can see the quality of, uh, you know, they look like pictures. But what you have to remember is none of these pictures were formed using light. They were formed using sound. The second thing is it's not like you click a button and you get an image like we do with cameras. There's actually a, a series of computations. You need the algorithm to form an image. Actually, even the, the conversation of clicking a button and getting an image, that worked in a film case when you would expose the image. But now, modern cameras, there is a lot of processing happening under the hood that you're not aware of. So let me give you some background on synthetic aperture sonar. Um, this is you know, um, just kind of a, a, a basic overview. There's a lot of complexity here. Let's say I have a microphone and a speaker, and I do something called insonification. So insonification, think of it like illumination but for sound. So instead of illuminating with light, I'm gonna illuminate with sound. Literally means I'm gonna blast some, uh, you know, I'm gonna blast some uh, uh, acoustic energy into the, the scene. And, you know, you're not like blasting like Spotify or like some like, you know, cool Taylor Swift piece, right? <laughs> Usually it's some designed waveform that you wanna to listen to the reflection. So I, I, I do think it'd be a cool undergrad research or master's research project to use common songs and see how well you could create acoustic images out of it. It's like one of my projects that I want to do just because I want to listen to some the music that kids are listening to. <laughs> so, so you insonify the scene and the field of view of your microphone and speaker kind of forms a footprint. And what you do, the key to synthetic aperture as opposed to real aperture is you move and you send out a signal again. So you're kind of like moving along the seafloor for whatever you're imaging and you're capturing acoustic signals that reflect back. Now, if you know where you were when you sent out your uh, transmitted signal and listen back, you can use that information to actually take this acoustic information and form a higher resolution image. You can actually focus the acoustic energy back. This actually is the principle of synthetic aperture imaging, first invented primarily for synthetic aperture radar, but the same techniques were then applied for sonar synthetic aperture sonar. And some of the earliest techniques is synthetic aperture sonar and sonar imaging. That's actually the, the theory of plate tectonics, right? That, that there are boundaries of plates that crush against each other. That was actually sonar helped to validate those theories in the early 1900s because they looked underwater and they were able to see these trenches and these plate boundaries. Um, so this technology was of critical importance for environmental, but also for military applications like mine hunting and other uh, kind of uh, looking under water. Okay, so let me just quickly describe how, uh, how you actually create the image. And this it has a little bit of math here, so I'll kind of walk you through it. This here, this measurements, pretend this is what I got at some position, this is my acoustic signal. But I know what I sent out into the scene. I sent out some sinusoidal pulse. Typically it's called a linear frequency modulated term. It's a cosine that increases in frequency. And I do a cross-correlation. So cross-correlation is a type of 
statistical signal processing techniques, I basically want to figure out where can I find the echo of my pulse in my data. And so I will get what's called matched filtered or replica correlated responses. So I do some acoustic signal processing to every position. And then what you get is if you plotted the acoustic signal as a function of range or time, I can actually, if I want to figure out how much acoustic energy came from five meters away, I can up, apply an appropriate delay to each of my acoustic waveforms and sum, so delay them and then sum the energy back. So in essence, because I know the speed of sound, I can figure out how much energy was coming from some, what we call a voxel, a 3D location, some distance away. Okay, so that's kind of, oh yes, there's a question. Uh, so you're doing all of this, you're reflecting sound and getting it back, but all of this incurs a lot of uh, errors in between, right? Yes. So, and it will keep on getting accumulated as you keep going on and on and like the medium would have it, the reflections would have, the sensors would themselves have it and so, how yes. do you kind of account for those errors? So yeah, so this, that's a great question. This is the perfect ideal case. There's a single thing in the world that's reflecting back sound. And truthfully, first of all, this picture is called a ray picture. Like I'm sending out rays of sound and you have it come back. But we know sound is a wave. So there's destructive and constructive interference, diffraction effects. There's also just multiple bounces. That also affects the light as well. Like when you take a picture, it's not just a single bounce back, it's multiple reflections. That, then things like noise or error, that could be like your microphones are noisy, right? Mm -hmm. Or if something else is uh, broadcasting energy at that frequency, it's going to interfere. <laughs> so let me show you an example. You're right. If you look at this conventional SAS reconstructions, there are a lot of errors. There are errors due to sampling, the errors due to hardware, errors due to um, processing and the physical environment. So what my research and my group's research has been focused on is how can we use machine learning neural networks to actually fix some of these errors? Not perfect, right? Like it's still, you still have some fundamental limitations of the acoustic system, but I'm gonna talk about two methods in order to do that. So maybe I'll come back to your question at the end after we see a full picture of 2D and 3D and um, then we can discuss some more, like what are the remaining challenges here. So this first paper, uh, <coughs> I'll just uh, acknowledge our collaborators from the Penn State Applied Research Lab. They actually go and build sonar systems. And at the end of this talk, I'll show you an underwater system and some underwater reconstruction. But this first application is called circular SAS. The idea is that you want to actually fly in a circle around your object in sonifying it hanging it with sound and listening to the reflection. And what others have shown is, if you notice in image A, that's if you just moved in a line and you, it's called side scan, you just passed by the object, you can't actually tell too much about the object details. But if you fly in a circle, every color here corresponds to a different angle. You actually get some information about the geometry of the scene and you can actually reduce things like noise and spectrum. Um, so circular SAS or CSAS is very, advantageous. But it still has errors, and I'll show you what the errors, where they arise from. One of the fundamental ones is you can have a bed of acoustic point scatterers. So think of it as like every point in space has an infinitesimally small point scattering. Those of you who have studied light or optics might know this as Huygens principle, like these little point scatterers that can emit uh, reflections. The problem is that I can't, I want to get to this. I want to get an image of all the point scatterers at the bottom of the seafloor, but I can't because our, my imaging system is fundamentally limited. In fact, it's limited by something called the point spread function. How much does an infinitesimal point actually become larger? If you're familiar with cameras, this is the concept of blur, right? Like if you remember like the, the old Hubble Space Telescope, when they first deployed it, it had a blur. And that blur meant that the, its point spread function was quite large compared to a point that they actually had to go and fix it, right? They had to fix some mirrors then and uh, in the adaptive optics to get a sharper image. They also did some fix in algorithms, which I'll talk about. So your sonar system has a blurring function. What's different about compared to light is that acoustic waves, we can measure phase. 
right? So if you remember from physics, like you, you get the phase of the wave in addition to the energy. So we have to do things in the complex way. Um, and if you assume, and this is a strong assumption, that the blur is equal across the image, this image on the right, that's actually what you would get if you computed with this hypothesized sensor. I mean, this is a simulated data. But I'll show you some real beamforming later. So it's really hard to tell what's going on. Like, what is this object here? What is this? And it turns out, like, you know, there's some rocks here, and there's kind of like a crate. This is like off of a, a, a uh, morph. Yes. Yeah. So it is effectively a uniform linear array, and then you are doing a direction of arrival kind of. Uh, yes, yes. So in this model, so I'm going to say this is not a perfect model. You might not get this. You might get something similar to this. But this model of, for first order approximation is good. But I'm going to talk about this assumption is very strong, and I'm going to break it later and, and show you like that we can still do things even if that assumption doesn't hold. So to solve these type of problems is something called a deconvolution. Basically, you convolved your image, your image, your point scatterers were convolved with something. But we can compute what this was, so we can try to do the inverse. Um, now, there's many ways to do this. One of the most common ways is called the Wiener filter, right, after Norbert Wiener. That's the classical method, or just iterative algorithms like Richardson, Lucy, deep blurring, or other algorithms. And the SAS community has their own versions of this. But I want to turn to these new uh, kind of technology is called neural fields. I'm just curious, how many of you have heard of NERFs or INRs or neural fields before? Okay, a few. So I, I, I put in a little primer, kind of a NERF 101. Uh, okay, so the first thing is the main problem with this is that there's so many names for this type of technology. There's NERF, position-free, positional encoding networks, coordinate neural networks, INRs. Um, NERF is actually the name of a paper, neural radiance field, but now people just call it NERFs. Um, but here's the basic principle. I want to estimate some kind of value at a coordinate. Maybe it's an image intensity. Maybe it's a light radiance. Maybe it's an acoustic intensity or acoustic uh, complex value like what we're going to do. So I'm going to use an, uh, a neural network with random weights to estimate that field. But that's kind of like just guessing some random number. What you do is you take that and you put it through what you have, it's called a forward map. It's your sensor model. It's like from the world, what does your sensor capture? If you can model that in a differentiable fashion, you can get an image or acoustic measurements and you can compare it to your actual measurements. And if this map is what's called differentiable, it, it allows the back propagation to update the weights of the neural network. So you basically optimize the weights of the neural network to get better and better. What's the advantage of this? No need for training data, right? This is called self-supervised or unsupervised. You don't need training data. The disadvantage is it can be slow and time consuming, that there has been some works to try to speed this up. Let me show you just a simple example. I want to get a neural network to output this image. Well, what do I do? I feed in coordinates to a multi-layer perception, a neural network. And through a series of weighted multiplications and adds, um, it gives me an output. And if I just did the output minus the ground truth and updated the weights using this loss function, this is what the network converges to. So it's not perfect, but it did get most of the colors in the right place, but it's blurry. So the key innovation was instead of putting regular coordinates, we can put some encoding of the coordinates like a Fourier basis, or this is not exactly a Fourier transform, but like sinusoidal frequencies, or people have done wavelets, or other kind of harmonic basises. We can do some sort of encoding to this, and that makes all the difference. It's kind of it's still a mystery exactly why this makes all the difference. There's some you know, research on this um, mm -hmm. that's kind of out of scope of this talk, uh, like neural tangent kernel theory, so on. But the point is, we're using the neural network as a function approximator. We don't know what the true function is. We're approximating it with the neural network and getting this. Now, the thing with this is this is just an identity forward model because my what I'm trying to reconstruct is the measurements. But in practice, oh, and by the way, this was popularized by the per paper NERF, neural radiance fields. I'll show you. This is not NERF, but one of its successors. You can see the quality of 
so all of these are like computer generated visual like interpolations between real camera viewpoints and it gets like the wires of the electric wiring so high fidelity so the advantage of this neural field or implicit neural representation is that it's super flexible it can be done for geometry problems it can be done for ct mri in fact, uh, my group has worked a little bit on computed tomography, and there's been works that show 2D, 3D, and we did some work on 4D or 3D in time, CT. These neural fields are able to reconstruct scenes. And if you're not convinced, uh, Katie Bowman's group from Caltech, she used a NERF to actually describe the dynamics of a black hole. So, you know, there was this famous first image of a black hole that was pioneered by Katie, among other, like a huge team of people from the Event Horizon Telescope. So she used a NERF to actually um, model the dynamics of the um, Event Horizon around a black hole. So I always like to say, like, you know, if it's good enough for black hole modeling, this, uh, this technique would work for our modern SAS data. So let me show you what I'm doing. Uh, I have a transistor position and recorded measurements. I have my waveform and scene clip. I can use that algorithm I talked about, beam forming or time and delay in sum is sometimes called beam forming to form an image in 2D. I can also, from the waveform, hypothesize what the system resolution is. Assuming there's a single point scatter at the center of my scene, I can kind of estimate this is what I expect to see. So all I want to do is take these two and recover back a sharper scene. And what we do is we just have the network estimate that scene such that when it's convolved with the blurry image, with the blur, it forms the blurry image that I can compare to. So think about it as like, the, in roughly speaking, the neural network is trying to estimate a clean image that when I apply my known blur model matches what I actually got from the camera. Right? And then if it didn't get it right on time t equals one, I keep adjusting the weights of the neural network till it converges. It's sort of like an optimization. You know, in fact, we had a reviewer say, this is not really machine learning because there's no data set. It's like, well, it's, it's optimizing. And so sometimes I call it neural optimization. Um, you know, these, these boundaries are kind of blur once you get into the techniques. But this is using the neural network to estimate this point scatter. Um, so what's different? So actually, all of this is not as surprising for those people who work in visual computing. So what makes acoustics different? Well, the main thing is that it has phase. So magnitude and phase is interesting. And the second thing is we're assuming the blur was spatially invariant. It was the same blur across the left side of the image and the right side. That's not exactly true. If the point is at the center of the circle, Researchers have shown that the uh, point spread function is actually real and symmetric. It's actually a Bessel function. Um, you can derive that from the acoustics. But if you move off axis or off center, what happens is if you're on this part of the circle, a little movement in theta will give you a bigger angle variation. But if you're on the other side of the circle, you're kind of very far away. So even if something moves, you don't get that much angular variation. This affects the measurements a lot. And what it does is it induces, now I'm going to just walk through these equations, so don't worry about the details. But we just actually take the center frequency and we add a phase term and an angular weighting term. So basically, every point in the scene has its own custom blur. And that blur is dependent on the geometry of the scene and uh, based on the angles present. Now, we can see this in simulation. Here's the center PSF, and it's very symmetric. And um, the far right one, you can see that kind of phase variation as the simulation moves. The other thing is there's other phase errors that can occur, right? The world is complicated. So you can't expect that if you send an acoustic signal that's five meters away, it won't come back exactly at the phase of that time of flight. You'll have some other random phase due to height mismatch, other errors. So computing the point spread function for every point would be time consuming. And so my student, Albert, was kind of trying to tackle this, and he came up with a really simple solution. Let's just let the network make, estimate not real point scatterers, but complex point scatterers. So we think of the acoustic point now as just inducing a random phase inherent 
to itself, and we want to estimate that field. So the network is going to estimate a complex number. And then we can still, because of this model that it's mainly the point spread function of the center modulated, we let those other terms be handled by the neural network, and then we can still do convolution and do our forward pipeline like I was describing. Okay, so I know that's like a little, a little intense math, right? So let me just show you some pictures. Uh, uh, so let's start with simulation. So this is seafloor. You see some sand ripples. You know, to this day, I've been to conferences where they really care about identifying seafloor ripples and sand textures. And there are researchers who study the dynamics of sand ripples and acoustics. And so it's super important for, um, you know, a lot of oceanographic applications. You can see here, this is called the ground truth. This is my simulation. This DNA, DAS, this is the conventional method. This is what is being formed. You can see because of uh, its frequency bandwidth and uh, various other non-idealities, you don't recover back the seafloor. <clears throat> or you would need to use more higher frequencies, more expensive equipment to do so. But the INR method, even from the DAS, it's actually able to recover back the sand ripples with uh, high precision. On the bottom, these are all like competing kind of classical approaches. Um, and this deep image prior is using a convolutional neural network, CNN, if you've heard of that, rather than these INRs. But I'll show you that while in simulation, it did work pretty much equivalent in um, real data, it tends to work. Can you change the ripple itself using sound waves? Uh, you need to send a lot of energy. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, like we're going underwater, yeah, it would be a lot. Um, you know, for biomedical, there are things like photoacoustic tomography, where, you know, you can use acoustics to then help focus the light. So in tissue, people do that. And for like ultrasonic, the, they will, but in general, for outdoor, you need to be, you know, you be, need to be blaring some speakers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, one thing I didn't mention about the frequencies we're using, we're in the 20 kilohertz which means I can't hear anything, but all of the young students can hear it because, you know, we all start to lose our hearing, you know, like it going down. So like it, it, for me, it just sounds like a click, like super high frequency because it's 10 kilohertz to 30 kilohertz. Uh, but I'm sure it's driving, you know, anyone who lived there who had pets, it's probably driving their dogs crazy because uh, we're just chirping and listening to chirps uh, as it's rotating. In fact, so how do we actually get real data? Now, getting underwater data is difficult. So as a proxy, we actually do kind of the simplest thing. My collaborators at Penn State basically built an in-air sonar system. It consists of a rotating stage, a speaker, and a microphone that are sending signals and receiving. It costs about $4,000 total for all the equipment, and most of the, most of the expensive part is the table and the data acquisition system. But this lets us do circular SAS. And the, the reason is because we don't, we can't move the microphone speaker because you'll get wires tangled up, right? So instead we just rotate the object. And so it's made to emulate a circular SAS yeah. set. And actually in air, you can still get a lot of the same reflection properties as in water. Uh, the only thing that you don't get is things like thermal gradients or salinity and those kind of effects we're not really modeling here. But the first principle reflection coefficients it, it, that's why bats use sonar too. It does work in air and, as well as water. Okay. By the way, this is a super fun project. Like if you ever wanted to learn how to make sonar systems really work, you try to build one of these. And, and I, have some, I have some undergrad students who are trying to make this a wireless, uh, like, like actually have an Arduino powering a microphone speaker. Of course, you know, we, we run against a lot of uh, issues with those microphones and speakers that we're trying to so low cost solution. So let me show you some results. So we emulated like a seafloor. We use these cork boards to kind of emulate different topologies on the seafloor. And the delay in sum, it does get the shape of the object, but there's a blur here, right? But the INR, um, I know it might be a little hard with this projector and the lighting, but you can see it gets a sharp edge um, while the other methods all have sorts of noise. And by the way, all of these methods are processed in exactly the same way. So that we're not like picking thresholds or it's all in apples to apples in the same dynamic range. So that seems to show pretty clearly that it's resolving sharp edges is important. Here was a challenging case. Like, 
you know, our precision is on the order of centimeters. So getting something like the handle of a scissors or a wrench, look, the delay in some, you're starting to get a lot of errors. Um, things like interreflections might be playing a role. But the INR is able to get back some of the structure, though it has some trouble with the metal here. But the remaining methods have a lot of error and uncertainty. And so using the neural field, it's able to predict a sharper um, acoustic field. In fact, this is kind of the real, uh, the big insight was if you go to lower frequency, you actually then don't sense time as well precisely, so you get some error. And the conventional reconstructions just start to break due to sub Nyquist sampling. You're not really getting the frequency content you need to resolve the high sharp features. But using the technique, we're actually able to do a reconstruction and get a reconstruction of the object. Okay, so that was our first foray into 2D imaging. And um, you know, there's a lot of details in the paper, but I wanna focus on the limitations. We can't handle if something is blocking the object. Point spread function won't tell you if something is blocking something in the scene. You have to actually know that from the environment. Second of all, we're working in the image domain. We're not really taking advantage of the acoustics. We did delay in some viewpoints, but we're not taking advantage of that. So we wanted to go to 3D geometry, and I'll talk about our approach that we did for that. So let's say I take a 3D scene. The principle is still the same for sonar. You're gonna take a sonar and you're gonna move it around and capture measurements. You don't wanna move in a circle because you want height variation. So you're gonna move in some arbitrary trajectory. A lot of times helical or cylindrical geometries are very common. And from your measurements and sensor position, you can do the same reconstruction algorithm. And you get something like this. And you can be like, why is this so bad? Right, And the reason is like, okay, you saw the quality of 2D images. Now that's just in two dimensions. As you add a third dimension, I mean, I always know when a student's like, oh, I got it working in 2D. Uh, I have one week left for my paper or my exam or my project. I'm just gonna get it to work in 3D. I just add an extra coordinate, it's gonna work. I'm always like, <laughs> never. Or in fact, if it works, I'm like suspicious, uh, <laughs> right? And it's because there's so many more errors. They don't equal each other. There's things like hardware, plays a larger role, uh, sparse measurements, Nyquist problems, uncertainty, and noise. So how do we fix this? And our solution is, again, to turn to neural fields, but we do a two-step process. Okay? So this is probably the most technical set of slides here, so I'll, I'll walk you through any equations as we go through. Let's talk about what is pulse deconvolution. So you remember I talked about match filtering, like doing, sorry, cross-correlation, right? which is called match filtering in this domain. Um, I have my pulse and I have my given measurements and I know that my true acoustic measurements can cross correlated with the pulse is equal to the given measurement. So I want to estimate this measurement that satisfies this data fidelity term that matches my measurements. And I can also do some tricks from optimization like adding sparsity regularization. Um, this actually works pretty well, and we can use a neural field to estimate these acoustic signals in 1D. Now, I'll just show you the results of this for the sake of time. You have, here is your ping versus time. This is also called the waterfall diagram, because uh, like, it looks like water falling down or moving. In, in uh, medical imaging, it's called sinogram space, or CT, it's called K-space, right? Um, but it's basically the data is captured in this domain. If you do cross correlation, you can see we're tightening, especially along the time domain, we're starting to see some structure, but it's still blurry. But pulse deconvolution actually gets sharper artifacts. What does this mean is if I zoom in, I'm now identifying structures with much greater time resolution. Why is that important? If I have a, a low time resolution, I don't know when I got my reflection back. That's going to affect all my algorithms, it's gonna to lead to blur. In fact, if I can precisely measure time of flight to arbitrary precision, I can get pretty accurate uh, than acoustic images, theoretically. So I need to do this first. And then the second thing is I need to, so, I, so now I'm working in the acoustic domain. I'm not actually doing image processing at all here. 
Um, I'm showing you images because that's the visualization, but everything I'm doing is 1D acoustic signals. Yes. Do you, have to, do you have to learn this for an individual sensor or for an individual scene? Yes, or? individual scene. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so actually all of these techniques like NERF and so on, think of them as like it's an optimization technique per scene. So unlike CNNs where you have a training set, you can train the model and then use it somewhere else, these methods don't have that generalizability in this form. I mean, the, people have tried to work on that, um, but yes, it's very sensor specific and scene specific. So Any you, of those changes, it doesn't happen. Yeah. So, so you're not just using like uh, NERF to reproduce the underlying data, you're also learning the underlying sensor function on a per scene basis. Yes, like you need to learn the under, like it's dependent on the sensors you use, the frequencies you use, any of those change, you need to change. But that's true for NERF too. If the camera changes, you do have to change NERF, or if the scene changes, you do have to change NERF. And what is the underlying scene? In NERF, it's this, um, like what we call the radiance field, which is basically the radiance along a 5D ray, like a point X, Y, Z in space being like pierced by a ray with a certain theta phi angle. So, so those 5D coordinates, I want to estimate what the light is. Here, for a 3D position, I want to estimate what the acoustic reflection coefficient is. If I were to move my uh, sonar array down the down the ocean just a little bit, yes, would I have to relearn this, or is is it specific to the? Yes, you would have to relearn that. You'd have to relearn it for those new measurements. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. So you need to decide beforehand. These are the acoustic measurements I want to do. These are the ping locations. Now do reconstruction. Uh -huh. Yes. Do okay. you ever have any problems with like hallucinating other? Like stuff because like yeah. I assume that you could have a different blur model and a different you know input into the the neural field and like get stuff that isn't actually there. Yeah, let me show this. I didn't go into this detail. Okay, so the conventional method, I'm getting this and I don't know what it is. When I did the reconstruction, notice that it actually gave me two edges. Mm -hmm. Like actually, I would have want the network to just give me one edge. Right. But somehow it didn't. And it's kind of unclear why it didn't. Maybe it's because this fit its convolutional model better than doing one. But this is kind of like when you optimize these techniques, you're getting to some kind of local minimum. I mean, it's not even guaranteed these problems are convex. So just like neural networks, it could be stuff. In 3D, I'll show you some more examples of hallucination. And <clears throat> yes, that also happens in visual data like NERF. If you took NERF and applied it to like glass objects or mirrors, like if, the conventional nerf, you start to get a lot of weirdness because those weren't modeled. And so, yeah, the, the, you know, we're kind of like, we're, we're you know, we're, we're kind of invoking a very powerful technology. And so you start to lose controls about guarantees of things there um, by doing so. I think that's a harder problem that underlies all of these types of techniques. Second problem, I got better acoustic measurements. What do I do? I can do delay in some beamforming. It does improve, but I'm going to actually introduce another type of beamforming based on neural networks. So what I'm going to do is something called analysis by synthesis law. Again, I'm going to take my given acoustic measurements that I just computed, and I'm going to try to create a scene, a 3D scene, that I can model what those acoustic measurements should be. Right, like what the blurry image should be, but here what the, the what the acoustic measurements measuring the scene should be, and then I can all again add some sparseness. So this is called analysis by synthesis optimization, um, and the key questions is how do I represent the scene? How do I synthesize measurements? So for scene representation, I'm just going to go back to our old friend neural field. I'm going to give it 3D points and have it estimate a point scatter. Um, is there acoustic reflection energy coming from that? But I need to have a forward model. Now, in the 2D case, I had this nice convolution model, super well understood, super simple to implement. But in 3D, we really had to challenge, like we could go for 3D point spread function, but we imagined the 2D problem into 3D, we would have a lot of issues. So we decided to uh, go with a physics-based approach. Uh, the physics-based approach is my collaborator at Penn State 
um, had developed this, what we call a point-based sonar scattering model. So don't be uh, scared by the equations here. I'll kind of walk you through it. Um, this was, this is the model we took and we made it differentiable. We added some transmission occlusion terms and we put it into the framework so that from a 3D scene, we can estimate what the acoustic signal is. Right? Now you can do this with wave solvers, but wave solvers are not differentiable and they're very slow and inefficient. So we have a transmitter red and a receiver blue. The transmitter ensonifies the scene with a pulse. When that pulse arrives back at the sensor, it's just delayed by the time of flight that's traveled. That's the phase delay. But the scene has a reflection. So if there's nothing there, it won't reflect back. That'll be zero. We assume this is Lambertian. Lambertian or diffuse means that it reflects equally in all directions. It's a very strong assumption, but it's a modeling assumption we use to make this work well. If you assume that it has a particular type of reflection profile, it's actually a little bit more difficult to get this model to converge. And then we hear it back. And we have these two terms, big T and little b. Big T is a transmission probability. It says, can I actually hear something along that ray, or is there something blocking? And so there are some ways from the NERF paper, I'm not going to go into the detail, to actually compute that. The second thing, little b, that's the beam sensitivity or beam directivity functions. That tells you what's the field of view of your microphone. You know, as I move away from this microphone, it's picking up less. So I can model it as like maybe a cone where I need to stay centered to get the best signal to noise ratio. Okay, now to do this, to get to the acoustic signal, remember a microphone is not like a camera. It doesn't have a lens. You can't focus the light. So you can't focus the acoustics in, at least in a normal microphone. There are ways to do it, but more complicated. So I need to integrate all the sounds I'm hearing coming back. That actually is very slow and inefficient. And this is where the first step comes in. If I assume that I did deconvolution perfectly, I got the perfect time of flight. I can model that reflection first order as a delta function. So I delta function means that I know the signal had energy or the time of flight had a response at only one particular time of flight and nothing else. Now, I don't know if, how many of you have taken signals and systems, but if you ever see an integral with a function multiplied by a delta function, there's a property of delta functions that you just evaluate the T coordinate at that time point called the delta shifting or sampling property. So by doing that, we can actually show that we don't need to integrate all the energy in the space. For a given time of flight, we know that the energy must come from a 3D ellipsoid. Why is this? I have a transmitter and a receiver. Put down two pins on a cork board. I know the time of flight was five meters long. Tie each end of the rope to those two, trace out all the possible uh, paths, first bounds paths from transmitter to scene to receiver that must form a 3D ellipsoid. So that's kind of the, that's the intuitive proof that uh, you, your sonar signal for, if you know your time very well, must come from ellipsoid. So we can sample along those ellipsoids efficiently. And basically what we do is now we're only concerned with this yellow curve, not the entire 3D space. And we can just have the network predict the acoustic scattering at points along these ellipsoids, add them up, and that will form the a single time measurement. Now I do this for many different ellipsoids, so it's still computationally heavy, but it's not uh, impossible or like very hard to converge. So we can now have the network predict complex point scatterers. So again, we still have phase errors. Let's just do that trick. And we can synthesize complex measurements. Um, you know that, that proof that uh, uh, if you know the time of flight, it's equivalent to an ellipse. That's, uh, that's written in the paper, but I'm skipping the details here. But you can see how we take the point-based sonar scattering model, and uh, uh, you can do that. So this is the final pipeline, just to be clear. We have the sonar measurements going to the pulse. We do pulse deconvolution. And we, synthesize complex measurements. The complex measurements, we then sample along ellipsoids and generate this complex scattering field. And then we put it through our forward model to estimate what those complex measurements should be. 
we subtract the two and update the neural field weights until this comes up. Now, um, on average, this takes about one to two hours in our uh, scenes, which are like 256 cubed or sometimes like 300 by 500 by 600. Uh, so it's definitely, you're sacrificing time to get better visual quality. So here's some simulation results. We used a transient time of flight render and modeled what the sonar would be. In the far right is the ground truth object. There's our method. The back projection, that's the beam forming algorithm. That's the classic uh, reconstruction. And you know we have some numbers to quantitatively evaluate that. But I want to focus on real data. So first thing we do is we go back to our AirSAS system, and now we move the microphone and speaker after we do a full revolution, we move it up. So we can synthesize cylindrical and helical scans by doing so. So a little bit of effort, but it, it, we're able to actually get 3D measurements of 3D printed objects. So this is a 3D printed armadillo. So the back projection on the left, it has a lot of errors. And the errors might be due to a variety of factors like noise, um, you're just in air, not a very well calibrated system. Um, and you can see our method is actually able to synthesize a better 3D visual product. Um, we're actually able to see a little bit more of the armadillos. Now, this is nowhere near the quality of visual data, right? And indeed, a visual data, you'll get to sub-millimeter accuracy if you do a very calibrated system. Acoustics, you're fundamentally limited by the wavelength, which is longer on the centimeter scale. And so, you know, there's only so much we can do, but this is kind of, some of the first, you know, like the, the 3D reconstructions in air using an off-the-shelf microphone speaker, this is pretty good results. I, you know, this is one of those results my grad student showed me, and I was like, you have a paper here. Um, even if it's only a armadillo, him and his maybe his extended family would love. <laughs> <laughs> um, reduce the bandwidth. Very useful for in a hardware setting if you don't want to use a lot of ADCs and data requirements. Now you're getting like really errors in the back projection, but our method is actually relatively robust. By the way, in terms of hallucination, I mean, there's some floating bits of energy. Hard to tell, was there actually acoustic signal there? Or did the neural network decide that's where we're gonna put energy to make it satisfy the forward model? It's difficult to say and would take more interrogation. Notice the back of the bunny is missing a lot. That's because the head blocked a lot of acoustic returns. And so that's why you're missing more data there. While you know the face, you for the most part, you get a lot of observations of it. If you go, there's this te old technique called compressive sensing, but it was really popularized idea of you go super low in your sampling and sub Nyquist rate, you don't expect classical theory to give you anything. Quick thing. But actually the network seems to be doing a lot of what we call sparse reconstruction. They actually can use the limited data to actually form something that's not so bad. Okay, the last thing is we really want to make this work underwater. So my collaborators at Penn State, see I'm doing time. Uh, my collaborators at Penn State, they have built a underwater system called the Sediment Volume Search Zone. Five transmitters, 80 receivers, 27.5 kilohertz center frequency, 15 kilohertz bandwidth, designed to image actually below the seafloor. Um, the reason for this is actually in World War II, the US military, among others, dropped a lot of bombs. And a lot of those bombs are actually on beaches. So there's a big effort, and I'm part of this effort, to develop technologies that image buried objects and try to recover it before somebody like steps on these mines, unexploded ordnance, so on and so forth. So how do we actually get, now that kind of data is very difficult, impossible to get to. So what did my collaborators did? This kind of ingenious. There's a lake in Pennsylvania that in winter, I know you Californians probably don't understand this, but if it froze, <laughs> it froze sorry, <laughs> it froze over in winter, right? So you can actually go out and my collaborators will dig holes and put these targets on the sea floor, on the lake bed or underneath the lake floor, partially or fully buried. And then they wait three months for the, the ice to melt and the lake fills up with water, about one to five meters above the target. So then in summer, they take this boat with the sonar system and fly over the system and scan it. And so it's like, it's very rare to get ground truth data of where objects are and what objects you put down, but this is uh, what the measurements we would use. So we got this data from our collaborators and we used our neural network method 
to apply to this. Um, one of the things I'm skipping over is this is a really hard problem. It's called a bi-static system. Transmitter and receiver are far apart. And the trajectory, it's not a cylindrical or thing. it's like, it's doing like kind of like a lawnmower pattern uh, or various other types of patterns on the lake. So we have no control over the system, but it shows that our method can actually do reconstruction. On the top, uh, this is a cross section showing you the intensity of a 2D slice. That's the sensor track reconstruction. What I'll show you here is that you see this energy here, here, and here. Those are objects. That's uh, two pipes sitting on the surface. And this is like a, a, a shot put that was buried in it. And then you can see our proposed reconstruction. Um, and it actually, it, it's interesting. It's, it's got benefits drawbacks. It was able to resolve a little bit sharper details, uh, but it is missing some things, and I'll point them out in a second. Uh, it's kind of hard to see with the MIP, this maximum intensity projection. So if you look down here, I zoomed in on a target. You can see how back projection, it's kind of a little hard to distinguish the target from the background um, This because of the not, not sharp features. But the proposed method, actually, you're able to reconstruct. Let me show you, this is some actual 3D underwater reconstruction. You can see the cores of the cement block here being resolved in our method, while the other back projection method is not as prominent. And you can see our method actually tends to suppress the background returns, which is both a benefit and a drawback. If you want to focus on the target, that's good. But sometimes maybe this you're missing something in the background. Here's another example. This is a cinder block turned on its head so that the cores are to the side. Let's see the response. Here's this uh, aluminum cylinder. Uh, notice you're not going to actually, I know the back projection looks like it's round that it gets better, but theoretically, if you're flying over the top, you should just see the top reflection. You shouldn't have any knowledge of the underneath. So that's just an artifact of the energy being spread. Kind of so um, that's kind of uh, like, uh, uh, kind of like, uh, a snippet of the paper. We have a lot more in the paper about ablation studies, and you know the data for the air data is available and and, and can be uh, replicated uh, by the Grant Accessibility Stamp Initiative. Um, so just definitely check that out if you want to see, especially that armadillo scene and the bunnies. So let me just kind of conclude here with like, what's the future vision? Um, it would be my dream if I could take out a microphone and speaker connected to Arduino, scan this room, and get a 3D reconstruction of you all. But we, we're not there, there yet. And the real question is, why aren't we there, right? Is it just, do we just need more expensive sensors? Or do we, is there still some fundamental problems? One fundamental problem is motion uncertainty. All of this assumed I knew perfectly where I was with a GPS or an IMU unit. Um, that could be uncertain. Second of all, you all might move. In light, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you move fast enough, you'll get motion blur, but you know, set the exposure time, you should be okay with a lot of light. But in sound, we'll get a Doppler effect, right? The Doppler effect is like when a siren is going, you'll hear the frequency change as it goes down. That's the Doppler effect. The perceived wavelength actually changes frequency. Um, we also have what we call other types of effects like multipath or what's called resonant and elastic scattering. Notice here, um, this object, there's no energy below it underneath the seafloor, but this object, there seems to be like energy below it. That's actually not from an object. That's from, imagine you took a bell and you hit it. The bell will ring and it will continue ringing for a long time. So this is actually an object that absorbed the acoustic energy and had the acoustic energy the wave is actually becomes a traveling surface wave and it's just ringing out at a particular frequency. But for the sonar, it looks like late turn, late time returns. And so this is both a bug and a feature. It definitely there's nothing there, but it tells you something about this object compared to other objects. And so, you know, our model of a first bounce ray model that I described doesn't describe this elastic scattering. And there are other kind of things like the material properties would be really interesting. But let me show you like, how can we use this today with acoustics and optics? So one thing we want to do for 3D reconstruction, if I was trying to do 3D reconstruction of the people in the back, I really couldn't get like the side information because I'm way too far away from them. I'm not scanning in a full circle. 
So that's called the limited baseline problem. And it's in, in frequency domain, it's called a missing cone problem. You don't have angular observations at extreme angles. But sonar, I can get the depth of the people sitting in the back with accurate time of flight. So fusing the two should give me better mm. instructions. And so my collaborators at Dartmouth who uh, actually pioneered this method, we worked with them to help create a Gaussian splatting. So Gaussian splatting is the, the modern equivalent of NERF. It actually doesn't even use the neural network. It just optimizes Gaussians in the scene. For those of you who are machine learning, it's kind of going back to Gaussian mixture models. In a, in a, and, and there's actually a, a realm of image-based rendering. We've been doing Gaussian splatting. It's not a new technique, but applied in this context, it's been getting a lot of attention. So just roughly, we have these Gaussians that we want to predict the scene geometry. We could always compare it to the image. That's what regular Gaussian splatting is. But now we just basically also splat it the z direction. Splatting is to like reduce its dimensionality to make it match the waveform in the z dimension. And we can get this using a sonar. Um, not a synthetic aperture sonar, but just like a microphone speaker listening to everything come back. Now, we have a lot in the preprint that's available online, including underwater, but I'll just show you what my lab's been doing. We took a DSLR camera and we put a microphone speaker next to it. And then we're scanning a scene on a turntable and it's moving relative to the scene. And this is the results of the reconstruction. The ground truth is this is an image that's not been seen, a viewpoint not been seen by the Gaussian splatting algorithm. The RGB only, notice how it's missing the bunny's face, the dinosaur, the teacup handle. This was because its original algorithm called structure for motion to do initialization it actually broke because we were doing it in low light and a white bunny on white background, very hard to get what we call visual features. But you can see just adding the sonar data as an additional regularization with the optical, we're able to recover back the bunny's face, the dinosaur's face, the teacup handle, uh, just using that acoustic energy. Because now we know roughly where objects are in depth and we can initialize our Gaussians there and use that as an additional <laughs> regularization to the Gaussian splatter. So I think this is kind of like promising early results of using acoustics and optics together. And this is kind of my vision that I'm going forward is sensor fusion between acoustics and optics. For instance, imagine there's two buckets, one filled with water, one not, and you're imaging it from the side. Optically, unless there's some condensation or some other cue, really hard to tell which, which bucket is filled with water. But the acoustics will have a different reflection. And so you can use that as a discriminating cue, maybe for some material properties. This is a problem I've been working on that I would have loved to talk about, uh, and I can talk about it offline, is you can actually use cameras to see around a corner. You can look at the, um, you know, I can look at a patch of a wall here and actually try to reconstruct or tell who's in the non-line of sight of the camera or the projector. Well, that's very difficult to do in light. But if I open the door, I can hear somebody walking down the hall. Why is that? Partly, it's because of diffraction. The sound waves will diffract around the corner, and I'll hear also just multiple bounces I can localize. So I think that you should be able to use cameras plus microphone speakers together to get better information in the non-line of sight. That has a lot of applications to like search and rescue or hidden pedestrian detection, or even biomedical, like imaging around a, an obstruction. So. I'm really interested in how can acoustics plus optics be used together for computer vision. But I hope this uh, talk kind of helps show you that acoustic imaging, while it's not at the levels of visual imaging in terms of quality and uh, um, you know, fidelity, it's, it's an emerging modality that can be paired very well with optical or on its own for different applications. So I think with that, I'll, I'll end here. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Suzanne. It was fantastic. Uh, I know it's already 12. If you guys have to leave, you can go, you know, do so quietly, but I'll take five minutes. I know there were a lot of questions in the middle of the talk, but if you have any other questions yeah. from the audience. Okay. People don't have much questions because they ask you a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.